Shallow Baptist Church of Landover, Maryland, and all of our visitors and friends, we welcome you to our midweek services and to let you know that there is a word from the Lord. First, give an honor to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is the head of my life. I'd like to thank Pastor Reverend B. Lewis Collington for this opportunity and to honor my mentor, Reverend Stephanie Stansel. If you would please turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 21. I'll start reading from the 18th verse and end with the 22nd verse, and that will be from the New International Version. But first we will have a word of prayer. Let us, Let pray. us pray. Father in heaven, thank you first of all for the first blessing of the day that you woke us up early this morning and you started us on our way and you got us to meet week services once again. I ask, O oh God, that I will decrease as you increase and that you will use me in a mighty way to bring forth a word to the people. So God, just be with us tonight. Be with everyone tonight and let us have attentive ears. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Again, that is the Gospel of John, chapter 21, starting with the 18th verse from the New International Version, where you will find these words. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus says this is to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Upon acquiring about John and how he might die, the Lord once again takes his servant to the woodshed. Peter has an age-old disease, which we call the foot-in-the-mouth disease, and he is forever sticking his foot in his mouth. Jesus tells him very clearly, Peter, the best thing that you can do is to stay in your lane. The next time you get a whiff of a rumor and go on a witch hunt against a fellow believer that is hanging on by a thread, the best thing that you could ever do is to stay in your lane. The next time you begin to get that itch to tell others how they should serve God and live for God, you need to retreat and stay in your lane. The church of today is full with claim jumpers that are dead set on jumping into the business of others. For a few moments, I wanna talk about stay in your lane and focus on Jesus. And my three points are, point one, the binding call follow me. Point two, the biting charge, focus on me. And point three, the billowing critic, find me. Unless you're prepared to deal with the aftermath, never invite yourself to a situation where your presence is not requested or welcome. Don't pull out a chair at someone else's table then turn around and be hurt when you feel unwelcome. And that was written by author Terry A. O'Neill. As a general rule, the phase staying in your lane often applies to one's driving and trying to remain safe in the midst of some rather unusual stunts by our fellow drivers. The Urban Dictionary defines it as, mind your own business, keep moving forward in your own life and don't veer over into another per person's personal affairs. Don't be nosy or insert yourself in someone else's life, business, or relationships. I firmly believe that if each of us would practice more self-awareness and self-reflection when it comes to our interpersonal relationships, we've had less, we would have less swerving out of our lanes and having emotional fender benders because we aren't paying attention or taking responsibility for our behavior. I have found that while I'm driving and every time I begin to look around, 
that my vehicle has a tendency to veer in the direction that I'm looking. There is a grave danger in taking my eyes off of my lane because when I take my eyes off of my lane, I'm subject to getting into a fender bender or just crashing. The church is full of rubberneckers that are too busy focusing on the attendance of others, the actions of others, and the absence of others than focusing upon Jesus Christ. How many are falling in their failing in their calling because they're too busy monitoring someone else. Let's keep it real and take a close look at staying in our lanes. Point one, the binding call, follow me. The Lord has just dealt with Peter in his three denials. Hopefully the meekness of Peter would usher him into useful service. He has just been confronted for denying the Lord on three distinct occasions, and he also has just completing confessing his love for the Lord three different times. The first challenge of Peter was this, go and feed my sheep. That was as clear and as concise as any person's calling can ever be, go feed my sheep. The Lord is not necessarily done with reinforcing the duties of his disciple, and allowing him to see the dangers that he must face. John 21, 18 of our scripture today says, very truly I tell you when you were younger and you dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not wanna go. Let us not overlook the reason why we are here. The mighty Peter boldly proclaimed that he would die for the Lord. The mighty disciple was ready to die for Christ, yet as he watched them lead him off to be tried and eventually crucified, all Peter could do was tremble as a traitor. Then he despairingly denied the Lord three times. Jesus has just hunted Peter down like a runaway child, and upon finding him, he confronts him and repentance is forthcoming and forgiveness was extended. The first decision of Peter was to go and feed the flock of God. That would not be an overwhelming task. He had walked with the Lord for three years and he knew all of the doctrines and the dogma of Christ's teachings. The Lord wanted Peter to see a bit further down the road and he informs him that this is not going to be a bed of roses. Peter is going to have to walk down a harsh path as he serves the Lord. In the past, he nobly proclaimed that he would die for the Lord. In the distant future, he was going to have that opportunity and he would die for his Lord. It is a holy thing to read of the lives of the apostles and see how each and every one of them die a martyr's death to the Lord. The Lord is telling Peter, listen friend, things are going to get tough and your path is going to be harsh. I'm letting you know now so that later on you don't think I misled you. I wonder how many of us would have stuck it out if that had been our job description. I'm thankful for your service, but in a little over 30 years, the enemy will hate you so much that you will hang upside down on a cross. Peter, I'm just giving you a heads up that the first day you preach, there will be over 3,000 people to become believers. Later on, they will throw you in jail for preaching my word, and then they will beat you, and many of those that are close to you, they will also die. We bail out on God over the most foolish things one could ever imagine. If it rains, the whole family stays home. If mama is sick, it takes every person in the family to hold her coffee mug and to blow her nose. If the baby is sick, it would be foolish for everyone but the mom to go on to church. If the preacher preaches on money, we will sulk and cry, then run out and buy a new boat or a set of golf clubs that cost more than most give to the church for an entire year. It is easy to quit. It is even easier to gripe, to complain, and to bellyache. I have never catered to the seekers because I have a better record at carrying the gospel to sinners. The seekers never burped and pampered, how sad. If God told every new Christian that his or her path might be harsh, most would run back to the world and would prefer to die and go to hell. It is high time that we got a good dose of reality and a good dose of true old time religion. 
We live in an age of fast food, easy living, and the less the pain, the better the gain. It would be wise for us to have less complaining and more commitment. It would be wise for us to have less excuses and more endurance. It would be wise for us to have less watching and more working. It would be wise for us to have less grumbling and more giving. It would be wise for us to have less advice and more action. When was the last time you pushed through a problem to serve the Lord? When was the last time you gave up something to God, uh, to give something to God? When was the last time you said no to the world and yes to God? When was the last time you put yourself last and God first? How deep is your love for God? How deep is your love for his church? In the 19th verse of the ch uh, chapter 21 of John, Jesus said this is to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. The Lord made sure that Peter knew that he had a harsh path in front of him and that there would be a heavy price to pay. I am afraid that we have a low tolerance of pain when it comes to paying the price for God. Why is it that we can sit in the cold of winter to watch a sporting event, yet we can't come to church if it's raining? How is it that we can sit through a hailstorm to watch little Johnny play ball and little Sally dance, yet we, can, we can't pay the price for serving God and his church when we are needed? I'm amazed at the silliness and the pettiness of the modern day Christian when it comes to being committed to God. All I know is how to do is to preach the book and the book tells me that a steward must be found faithful. The book tells me to pick up my cross and to follow the Lord. I did not write the book. My duty and passion is to preach the book. The issue with this age is that we want the best of both worlds. We want the best that God has to offer us, yet we will not pick up the cross because we will not pay the price. We want the pleasures of the world, but we are not willing to endure the pains of serving God. The modern day believer has reduced the Christian life down to two simple words, give me. This age wants God to give to them. Listen to their prayers. All they have to do is ask for more. God, give me more. God, give us more. We want to be saved, yet live for the world. We want to sow in the world, yet we want to reap the good things of God. We live like hell on Monday through Saturday and pray for a miracle on Sunday. I want to make sure everyone grasps what I'm saying. Go ahead and teach your children that ball is more important than God, but don't expect something magical to occur when they realize sports won't get them to heaven. Go ahead and take the easy believers route, but don't expect to harvest the good things of God. You go ahead and teach your family that God is trivial and the church is only there for, for you when you want to visit. But don't expect to harvest the good things of God. I am amazed that our churches are filled with men and women who can aspire to greatness in the world, yet can't do anything within the church. That is an indictment against what we believe and where we stand. We, we run from suffering and we abandon God and his church when the going gets tough. Jesus sets his face as a piece of flint to get, the, get to the cross. He ran to the cross, not from the cross. The Bible says in Luke 9, 51, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. We get our feelings hurt and we bail out on God and the church. It is amazing how tough people are on a job, but when it comes to toughness at church, they will bail out and run for the hills. Point two, the biting charge, focus on me. The Lord has just given Peter his first words of instruction, and now he will give him an even sterner word of instruction. Peter has just been told of how he would die by the way of the cross, which would be nearly 30 years down the road. Peter did not have an issue with being a martyr for the Lord, but he could not allow the moment to pass without stepping out of his lane. She removed her shoes and tossed them in the stands and waved triumphantly, bowed graciously, and went on television to say she had won the world championship at 200 meters. 
even after someone had stolen her favorite spike shoes. Then Gwen Torrance found out that her gold medal was gone too. Her winning time of 21.77 seconds was disqualified after a track judge ruled that Torrance had stepped out of her assigned lane, thus gaining an advantage over opponents by running a shorter distance around the curve. Torrance filed a protest, but it was unanimously rejected by a seven-member jury of appeals chaired by Primo Nibolo, the president of Track and Field's world governing body. Television replays show Torrance stepping on the inside boundary of lane six, her assigned lane, at least three times in the curve, and once stepping over the line into lane five. The rules state that a 200-meter runner must stay in the lane the entire race to ensure that every competitor runs the same distance. The gold medal was awarded to Marlene Otley of Jamaica, the silver to Irina Provolola of Russia, and the bronze to Galina Machinga, also of Russia. Into a headwind, Torres ran the fastest 200 meter the, the, in the world that year. After winning the 100 meters early in the week, she appeared to become the first double winner at the 1995 World Championships. The victories would have firmly established her as the sport's dominant field female sprinter with the Olympic Games approaching the following summer in Atlanta, her hometown. But 15 minutes after the race, the 30-year-old found herself disqualified without the 43,000 Mercedes-Benz as first prize and perhaps without tens of thousands of dollars in endorsement money that would have come her way as world champion at both the 100 and 200 meters. Tor said calmly, I know I had a clear victory before her protest was rejected. I can't worry about it. I will just have to beat them at the Olympic Games. She cheated, the 35-year-old Otley said of Torrance. She ran about two meters shorter than everybody else. The other Russian um, sprinter said, it's a rule for everybody. Nobody can run out of their lane. If it, it is not a rule, everybody can do the same thing. It seems that Jesus and Peter had just begun to walk after they had eaten the fish, and at that time, Jesus confronted him concerning, concerning his three denials. As things were coming to a conclusion, Jesus informs Peter about his coming death by crucifixion. There may have been some unhealthy competition between Peter, the leader of the Twelve, and John, the teacher's pet. Peter looks around and sees John coming up from the rear, and once again, his mouth overloads the wagon. He immediately inquires as to how John would die. The moment he asked this question, he stepped out of his lane. One of the keys to, to running and even more so running on the track is to focus only what lies before you. The track runner must focus on his lane and not worry about what is behind him or who is behind him. Some of you cannot enjoy God or the church because you're too busy looking at other people. There is nothing more inviting than a peacock Christian that is always sticking their nose in everyone else's business. If you were nearly as spiritual as you thought you were, you would pray for them, not run them down or talk about them. There are people in our local churches that keep up with the attendance of everyone. They monitor the attention, attendance of others, the giving of others, the dress of others, and the conversation of others. These people are much like Peter. They are too busy worrying about everyone else, and God is about to verbally chastise his servant. If you were nearly as great as you think you are, you would buy a good dose of humility. We are reminded in Matthew 7, 1, do not judge or you too will be judged. And in Matthew 7, 2, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. The Bible clearly tells us to stay in our lane. If we stay in our lane, we will worry, we will worry about the plank in our eye rather than the speck in the eye of our brother or sister. Matthew 7, 5 says, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. 
I am puzzled at the nerve of some that are so quick to judge and to pounce upon others within the church. If you are focusing upon the ups and downs of others in the church, you are not focusing on the Lord. Those of you that are so holy and so perfect should be praying for others, pulling for others, and being a beam of support for others. There is nothing worse than seeing someone within the church backbiting and devouring another believer. If we are so spiritual, we would not be eaten up with jealousy, envy, or bitterness. Jesus said in John 21, 22, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Jesus mixes no words in putting Peter in his place as he informs him that it is nothing to him concerning the death of John. Basically, Jesus is telling Peter to be quiet, follow me, and focus on me. And my last point, the billowing critic, find me. We need to follow Christ, focus on Christ, and truly find Christ. The church critic needs to find the Lord, and upon finding him, start following him and then focus upon him. The greatest thing that you can do in serving the Lord is to find your lane and run in your lane and then stay in your lane. This does not mean we are not concerned for others, but we are not appointed as their judge. The Lord did not make you to be the judge. He is the judge and he will judge. My dear brothers and sisters, you are to stay in your lane. We do not have time to focus on everyone else. It takes all that we have to keep ourselves within our own lanes. We need to seek after the Lord, find his will for our lives, and then just do it. Lastly, I want to say a quote from a preacher in Dallas, and he simply put it like this. We must learn to accept the calling God has given us. Get a clear understanding of what God has called you to do. Stay in your lane and find value in your part in God's ultimate plan. And that quote was from T.D. Jakes. May God bless all of you and may you stay in your lane and focus on Jesus. Let us pray. I pray, my brothers and sisters, that something that you have heard tonight will have pricked your hearts or will have stirred your hearts. And if you do not know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that you will want to follow him, that you will want to focus on him, and that you will want to learn more about him and allow him to save your soul. So God, I ask that if there's anyone out there who does not know the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that they will want to join a church and that they will want to get to know you more and more and more for themselves through your word. I also pray, oh God, for those who have may have fallen away and not following your word. I pray, oh God, that you will prick their hearts and give them a word in their ear and that they will come on back to you, oh God, and continue to study your word. I pray, oh God, that you will just bless everyone under the sound of my voice tonight and that they may have gotten one small nugget tonight that they may be able to carry with them throughout the rest of this week. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us for our midweek service. We pray the message you just heard will bless you in a mighty way. Please share our Shiloh Baptist Church YouTube channel link with all of your family and friends so they can be blessed as well. Now, you have the opportunity to bring your tithes and offerings to the storehouse as God has asked faithful believers to do. Just go to shilohbc.org forward slash give or send a text to the number on the screen or you can mail your offering into the church or stop by the church to drop it off. Just remember, God loves a cheerful giver. Join us each Sunday at Shiloh for Sunday school at 9 a.m. and Sunday worship service at 10 a.m. We would love for you to join us in person. If that is not an option for you, you can participate virtually as well. Then join us virtually each Wednesday for midweek service and Wednesday night Bible study. Here at Shiloh, we are a Bible preaching, Bible teaching church with a focus on saving souls. Remember that Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 tells us, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Until we meet again, always be blessed.